All right, and we're we're live. Um, so Henny Hotu, I'm Jean Luc Perry Tisa, I'm Tayaron Le Good Halaik Tisa. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jean-Luc Curit, and um, I'm uh, speaking to you from the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation, uh, who continue to this day in part through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapo. Um, this is uh, my kitchen and JP, not, not Jefferson Parish. This is Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Bobancha Public Access and, and Haley Daradar. Haley, go ahead and um, introduce yourself. Lisa, Seah Chefiat Haley Daradar, Omasea. Hello, my name is Haley Daradar. I am Homa. I'm currently on the Castaway land in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I'm I'm the person on the ground who still has internet access and is not picking up sticks. Who's uh, who's part of a whole bunch of public access, a project started by Haley Dardar, Ida Aronson, and Jeffrey Garensberg. Um, and we're, we're really excited to have, um, we're not really excited that John Luke's here. We're kind of sad that this is happening, um, but we really appreciate John Luke stepping in and doing this. Thank you. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, before, um, before we begin, I have, um, some sage here that was gifted. So I'm, I'm uh, just a little background on me. I'm here in, uh, here in Boston, uh, Massachusetts Territory, I'm president of the North American Indian Center of Boston. Um, and uh, we were gifted on a trip to Millinocket, Maine, we were gifted some uh, white sage by Wabanaki Public Health. So I just wanted to just uh, start off um, this, this session just kind of uh, centering ourselves um, and really just kind of thinking about, you know, everything that has transpired, not just the past 24 hours, but like um, past, past week, past month, past years. You know, we're, um, we're not, we're not here as a product of a single event, a single storm. You know, there are many storms that have uh, been going on through all of our lives. Um, you know, um, 16 years ago, when the storm uh, came to New Orleans, um, in many ways, we said that the storm was, was always happening. You know, we always mourn like all of the different places that we don't have, that they ain't there no more. And, you know, it's, we're very happy for all of the, all of the times, all of the things, everything that we've been gifted, all of the memories that we've had in the spaces. Um, and we absolutely mourn the loss of any any life or, or property, but um, we are we are who we are because we are the the descendants of the survivors. Um, we are um, the indigenous peoples from uh, from Louisiana. Um, so this is. This time is um, it's hard, but we have to kind of remember, we have to think about time, not just in seconds, minutes, hours, days, but think about years, think about generations, think about centuries, think about all of the things that we have endured to bring us to this moment. And we just, we just enter into this space in, in gratitude because of all of that. So a bit of, uh, this is a bit of an undertaking because this is the first time 
and I'm, I'll move the, the sage a bit so I don't have the smoke blowing in the camera too much. We'll get, we'll get some blessings. We'll make sure everybody gets their blessings, but I uh, want to make sure that, uh, that the, the camera is a little clear. But yeah, this is a bit of an undertaking because, um, put it by the pan. <laughs> there we go. Much better. So uh, yeah, bit of an undertaking because this is the first time, um, you know, thank you again to 12 Bunch of Public Access for providing this space, providing this airtime, so that we can not just not just like reflect on what what's happened, but actually tell people you know a bit about who we are, uh, who our families are back home, who our communities are back home, and then people that are seeing all of this for the first time and just becoming conscious of like our experiences and our stories, like how can they help us in this moment? So that's one thing. Yes, yes, Haley. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm hearing something and I'm wondering if we can help name what's happening. Uh, I know that it's so, so present to us um, that may, but it may not have, you know, consumed everyone's life in yesterday uh, for everyone else. Um, so yesterday's stream was really about helping people who were on the ground, but um, Jean-Luc, I'm wondering if you can give a quick, just recap of like what's been happening and, and why we're here today and, and what's why are we on this zoom and what what's Ida and what does it mean to us yeah so I think you know I think a lot of things like um again just going back the past the past 48 hours um you know within within that time uh 72 hours maybe um within that time uh hurricane ida um it went from a tropical storm uh then it crossed over cuba formed into formed into a hurricane went over the warm waters of, of the gulf of mexico um and it made landfall and this was um for those for those who you know had been watching some of the live streams or know some of the news or whatever, these types of storms, um, where winds exceed 150 miles per hour, uh, almost a Category Five when it made landfall, uh, we actually have to go back to the 1850s uh, in Louisiana history in order to um, you know see those types of storms. Uh, so this is something that, you know, for many of our community members um, who, I don't want to say chose, um, but for many of our community members who remained at home um, and, you know, some maybe, maybe not, but, you know, we've, we've seen hurricanes before, they've come onto the land, you know, we can ride it out and all of this. You know, that's, that's one thing, but this is something that we haven't seen um, uh, for a very long time. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the significance of, of like just the impact. Going, uh, going into the state, when it made landfall, um, we saw that the storm did not actually make landfall because Louisiana is not that beautiful boot that we see on political maps. Uh, Louisiana is very much covered in, in water. Um, and so the storm made landfall, but then went into the, um, went into the borders of Louisiana um, and sat over um, the, the marshlands uh, that are there in the Southeast. Uh, and so I, I had heard it called the, the brown ocean effect. And so, you know, this is a system that had two eye walls and it just, it just sat there uh, for hours. And because of that, um, many of our communities um, in, in Terrebonne Parish um, and St. John Parish, um, you know, some 
we're, we're just now getting some light. Um, so we're, we're just now being able to assess what has happened physically to the landscape. Um, Orleans Parish last night, all, you know, the, the city itself went completely dark. Um, so, you know, when I woke up this morning uh, to check the news, the first thing that I saw, you know, was just darkness and maybe like some, some police headlights and, and floodlights, you know, shining spots on, on the Harris Casino on, on Canal Street. Um, so, you know, woke up and the landscape was in, in total darkness. Um, so we're at a point right now where it's unsure, people are just now able to kind of like assess what has happened with the wind. Um, in some spots, the, the water, um, there are people in, in La Place, uh, I read last night that had to escape the waters into their attics. And, you know, we're thankful for the Cajun Navy and all of their uh, all of their efforts to, to save some of those people. So it's, it's a very, it's a very fresh wound, but it's a very significant wound at this moment because of everything um, that we're, uh, we're faced with. And this is, you know, and I, and I also want to like, you know, just call out, you know, this is what we're faced with at the, at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Um, at the, at the headwaters, we have our Anishinaabe relatives right now um, that are resisting, um, you know, praying, uh, protecting the waters, the Mississippi headwaters um, from the Line 3 uh, pipeline, um, trying to uh, do whatever action they can to get the governor to, to act, uh, to get President Biden to act. So we're at, we're at a point where you know, from the headwaters to the mouth of the Mississippi River, our people um, need some show of solidarity. For, for, this, uh, for this conversation, we're going to focus on, you know, what's happening in Southeast Louisiana, but, you know, all of us, you know, have all of our, all of our people in mind in this moment. So, uh, Ellie, did I miss anything? No, no, I think that's good. And I think that we're going to continue to cycle back and talk about this. Uh, I, if I had to put what we're doing today into three words, I think it's, uh, it's um, kind of, uh, you know, processing things together, um, assessing how we can help and cooking some beans. I know, I know, I know. And on top of, on top of everything, like I was um, I'm, I'm running around. I got my beans last night. They're, they're on the, um, they're, they're off the stove. They've already soaked. Um, and, you know, I was also like brushing, you know, getting all the tech together, cleaning my kitchen because, you know, I'm opening, opening up the house here for everybody. And I don't want anybody to, to come up in the kitchen and say, oh, I don't like the, his stove is dirty. Or like, oh, you can I wash my vegetables. I wash my vegetables. Wow. I, if y'all, if y'all got, if y'all got any, if anybody wants to say anything about the way that I cook, the way that the kitchen looks, or anything like that, you know, um, let's 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 keep let's keep our minds on the bigger picture. <laughs> I would keep, love I would love to get a, a kitchen tour at some point. You know, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see the work that you've done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like opening up your closet. It's a real, real thing, you know. I know. Oh, I really yeah. appreciate it. I'm not, even, not even that. I don't want it, the, only in this space. I've only, I've only been able to like get this space under control for, for everybody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's. Um, so yeah, so like, like you said, you know, we're uh, we're here. We're uh, we're making uh, some red beans. Um, so what I'm gonna do really quickly, I'm gonna switch to my webcam here. And I have, let's see, let me make sure my, I'm live. Okay, so you can see the, uh, you can see the chopping board, but I just wanna make wow. sure the YouTube live uh, has a chopping board. 
I that's, have, a, that's a, some impressive tech you got going on. I don't know. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, impressive tech, but like, okay, here's 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 like comment number one. Why Jean Luc? Why are you starting off with the yellow pepper? Like, okay, I, that's what I had in my refrigerator. We're doing okay. what we have in our refrigerator right now. That's, so, that's uh, so yeah, so I uh, so you know first first thing first for your for your vegetables. If you're cooking um, pretty much anything, um, you know, from cooking like I know, let me just say that I don't know. It's just like it's no matter no matter what the no matter what the, the situation is, everybody's got something to say about the way that you cook. So I'm just gonna just say the way that I know. So we have what it's called the Holy Trinity. You have bell peppers, onion, celery. That's your three. Uh, that's your three base ingredients. And what we're going to do for uh, for this whole thing, we're going to actually be building uh, this this part of the, the process. We're going to do uh, some prep work uh, to chop up the vegetables and everything. Um, but then after uh, after uh, like I switch over, we're gonna uh, we're gonna make a roux. Uh, then put the put the vegetables in there. Um, I have you can see that I already did some uh, some pre cutting, so I have the seeds out already. I have the onion already peeled. I have all the leaves and the roots and everything off the celery. So you know this is all getting ready to chop. All of that stuff I didn't put that in the trash. I put that in a pot and. With uh, with just a little bit of seasoning, some lemon juice, some I, I like to use apple cider vinegar. I put that and I set that so I can make a stock. So what we're gonna do bravely, <laughs> we're gonna start with chopping up uh, this bell pepper. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Where did you learn? How did you learn how to cook beans? How did I learn how to cook red beans? So it's a, it's a, it's a mixture. It's um, because, so my family is all, we have always been in Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, my dad's dad is uh, Joseph Breit Jr., our first tribal chairman, Petunica Biloxi. And his mom is uh, Fanny Lou Ben Pirit, and she is from the Stan and Pine community uh, in Mississippi, so Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. And um, you know, I always had kind of that that mixture, and even like on my uh, on my mom's side, you know, my uh, my grandmother there, she's she's from Louisiana. My, uh, my grandfather there, you know, a lot of the genealogy uh, points back to uh, points back to Mississippi. So we've always we've always been in the Delta region. But regardless, I mean, regardless of like being kind of geographically close like that, you got to um, I mean, it's almost like wherever you are, like how close you are to the river and everything or wherever you are geographically, even within the Delta, everybody cooks very differently. Everybody has like, you know, different types of, um, different types of ingredients and all of this. So, um, so yeah, so it was just a lot of like watching, watching grandparents, watching my mom cook. First thing I ever cooked in my mom's house was some scrambled eggs. And <laughs> she was like, thank you very much. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but, from, but from that, and then, um, and then actually like, you know, it's, it's actually kind of being away from home um, was what, you know, what really taught me how to, um, how to do you know what I do from on on the regular because you get away from New Orleans, 
And then everybody, you know, you tell everybody you're from New Orleans. What's the first question? Oh, cook. Yeah. you what know you how cook? to cook. You know how to make that good food. I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, and then they're like, oh, can you make that good food for me? But can you make it like, you know, can you make it vegetarian? Can you make it like this? Can you make it like that? And it's like, oh. Oh, Jean Louis, let me tell you a story. One time I was making gumbo for people. I was just making a gumbo. And I was like, okay, let me invite people over to eat this gumbo. So I started, you know, texting a bunch of people. And then somebody texted back, um, are you making my girl making it vegan because my girlfriend, um, my girlfriend's vegan? I, it just kind of stuck at me. And I was like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, I, veganism is, is something that I'd, I'd love to get to a point of, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> but yeah, it was like, this is a, this is a cultural recipe, man. Like I can't just make it vegan. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, it works. <laughs> and then, and then you, um, and then you like try to go back home after all that mess. And then people will, um, you know, see what you see what you're trying to do. <laughs> oh, I think we got a little bit of echo. <laughs> okay, is that better? Yeah, I think that's better. No, people will try to see what you're doing in the kitchen, and you know, you used to cooking for vegetarians and vegans and all of this. And uh, the first question that people ask when you pull out all your ingredients, they'll be like, where's your meat? <laughs> what? It was like, how, how, how are you cooking without any meat? <laughs> I guess that segues into a question that we kind of wanted to address here too, was like what it is to be, you know, we're talking about it in the sense of cooking, but what is it to be not in Louisiana right now? Yeah, and like, you know, if you are, if you're away, if you, um, you know, and you don't have like, like andouille sausage, like we know, mm -hmm. or, like, or like Patton's hot sausage, or like, you know, what, what's, what's some really, what's some really like good, like if you were, if you were able to like go back home uh, and just shop, and then like bring something back up to uh, <laughs> to where you are. Honestly, I got a story about that. So that for honestly for me, that's andouille. Um, andouille, yeah. It's just like so andouille sausage is just kind of like a peppery smoked sausage, and I have had the darndest. I, I use it a lot for seasoning within my dishes. Like you, you rely on it as like this fatty component, the spice component, and also the savory meat component. It's just like mm -hmm. this beautiful package. But like mm -hmm. most thing is like around the idea of, oh yeah, you're going to totally have andouille sauces available. <laughs> um, oh, and so yeah. like all of my dishes now have, have been like a little bit less spicy, a little bit less smoky and flavored because it's just, it's just a hard ingredient to find. I know one of my friends, yeah. um, Anna, whenever she goes back to Louisiana, she will pick up like a case of Mandu's sausage and she will smuggle it back into to this part of the world and freeze it and it's just like her entire sausage her entire fridge is, is filled with with andouille sausage it was like yeah this is the most uh -huh. important ingredient that's that's most difficult to find yeah uh, i remember I'm, yeah i had like a little paw patrol uh cooler and i was bringing back onto it and all this the, the tsa didn't stop me <laughs> <laughs> Didn't stop. Uh, okay, go ahead. Oh my goodness. What else? Yeah, the onions. Was, was a time where, like, you know, if you wanted grits outside of the South, you had to go back home and then and then bring that with you back. Like, wow. you know, just like Quaker instant grits. I think, I think, well, no, though, I, I would say like the Quaker instant grits. That's what my friend, when I was uh, staying in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, my, um, my friend Malcolm, who graduated from Abramson with me back in New Orleans East, you know, when I would go back home, I would, you know, bring back a couple of boxes because it was that, those, those instant grits from Quaker that were, uh, that were flavored, that had like the, the cheese and everything. 
Like, I think there was like a oh. couple of stores you could get grits from, but like to have the flavor ones. That was that was the trick. Nice. All right, yeah. I'm trying to set up with a, a webcam also, so um, oh, yeah. I don't know if it's gonna let you in. Let me. Oh, in. Okay. I'm gonna okay. uh, see how this works. Okay. Okay. Got so it. just Thanks. show her that when you um. Okay. Let's make sure that you have one microphone on yourself. Yeah, working <laughs> on it. Okay, how's that? There we go. Okay, good. Okay. So how, how are things on your side? So I'm trying to turn off the volume. Okay. Hey, is this better? Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay, great. Let's see if I can mute this. I feel like I'm 80. I am 80. Okay. What was that? I said, I feel like I'm 80. And then I realized like I am 80. Like <laughs> this is extremely <laughs> difficult for me to do. Okay, no worries, so. <laughs> no I mean, we, we shouldn't be doing this like too, too professionally, too, too much. Like, you know, we know what we're doing because then they're going to be like, I like when, I like when Haley and John Luke had this show. I want more of that. And we're going to end up having a full-time job doing that. If our my first time John job, time job John Luke was cooking with you and like just talking, that's not a bad full time job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, there's, there's yeah, worse things I've done. Part, but like the actual like I, I'm the, I'm the television host and you're the producer sort of thing, or maybe I, or the other way around. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm done with that. <laughs> Absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think things are going good. How do you feel about, you know, I don't know. I've been watching. Oh, I'm still having an echo. I'm really. Hmm. Okay. I'll let you. I'll let, I'll let, you let me figure out. this out. Yeah, okay. figure it out. And ask that question again. I need a, how, so Jean-Luc, how did you make it so that, um, oh, I should just put myself on mute. Okay. This is figuring it out. No tech rehearsals here. What was that? I said we don't do tech rehearsals here. We just kind of jumped into this. Okay, sounds. Yeah. Audio. So yeah, so if you um you want to put your audio um if you like the one, the one that you have, the audio that you don't want to pull from, mm -hmm. then just disconnect the uh, the computer audio from that one. Like okay, yeah. any any sound in or out on that on that device, and then you should be able to like just have the sound from from your phone. Okay, yeah, I, it's a speaker that's really popping me off. Let's see. I think I'm gonna uh, chop up this whole onion. So what I'm doing, just so that everybody has documented like all my steps and everything, I'm cutting along the, uh, along the stripes here, just like maybe like an eighth of an inch or thereabouts. Cutting down that way. And then I'm gonna just go width wise down this way. So that way we have all of our onion chopped up. And then I like to turn it. And I feel like the, the, the grip is kind of loosening up. Yeah, uh, that's 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 the thing about going back to learning cooking and everything. Just like trying to figure out how to do everything with what you have, being away from home, learning all the tricks from all sorts of different people. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, it all gets kind of up in the mix, but I, uh, 
but I had, uh, I went back to Marksville one year and I started making mock shoes uh, over there, but kind of doing it like after like kind of being out and, and doing things on my own. My sister took one bite of the mock shoe and she turned to my mom and she said, how come you didn't teach me how to uh, cook like this? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it wasn't. I'm oh, sorry, Elizabeth. I don't. I don't. If you watch it or whatever, I don't know if you remember saying that. It doesn't. <laughs> I, I, I sure. I surely remember her saying that. But I was like, it, it wasn't. It was my mama. It was my my um my grandparents, and then everybody, everybody with all of their opinions out on the road like that. <laughs> trying to get me to do stuff. Yeah, I'd like, I like to kind of mash the, uh, the garlic down. So I have the, uh, the, uh, the Trinity, but then I also have my garlic here. So I'm gonna take the knife, press it. That way it crushes up a bit. And then you can actually take the peel off really easily like that. This one, that's it. There we go. All right. Now, have we um, have we heard have we heard from anybody uh, this morning? I. There were a couple of people that I was talking to last night, um, thinking about joining us. Um, and then that'll, that'll probably be like a little bit later. But um, I just wanted to know if there was anybody that was that was hoping to get on and join the conversation within the next few minutes or so. Hey, yeah, no, I'm, I was thinking about that and I think we're going to need to call people. Um, so I was going to kind of put my beans in and then, um, and then maybe check in with people. I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of people are going to be out working in their yards, but, um, it would be great if we can get, you know, once we get the beans started, I think we should start working on the, the assessment part of trying to figure out what's done and then the research part, part of trying to help people figure out what they need to do um I'm thinking it would be really great if I can try to I'm going to try to get Ida on the phone maybe there's some person I was thinking of calling they've weathered out the storm in the United Home Nation Tribal Center um, yeah. and so they're they're kind of first line on what's going on in Homa Louisiana mm -hmm. um so we can kind of get an assessment on that I know also Donnie Burden with the United Home Nation he's uh He's at home. He just, oh no, actually he's in Texas, but, uh, but I think he has a pulse on what's happening in, in lower Lafouche. That would be helpful. Okay. Um, how about you? What were you thinking we could do? Yeah. I also like message, so I, I messaged, um, so we do it. So for all of the people on the live, we're doing a little back, back behind the scenes about <laughs> who we're trying to get, right? This is, this is also part of the process of like, you know, who, who have you who have you reached out to? Have you checked in with this person? Have you checked in with that person? So, you know, we do we're doing it live. <laughs> um, but I, I I sent a few messages. I sent one to um, someone to Robert out here, Robert Caldwell. I sent one to Monique Verda. Um, okay. So she and and I think I think she said that that we'll talk uh, we'll chat today, um, and then. Uh, Andrew uh, Jolivet, okay. um, out, out in California, so it might be a little later before we are able to like get in, uh, get in touch with him. But okay. we want to make sure that you know we had like local folks, but then also like people that are from are from Louisiana and like you know trying to trying to get in touch with their family just like we are. Yeah. Yeah, because it would be really great if we can get some on the Grand Dion News, but I'm also aware of like how difficult like people talking to us is not their most important thing right now. Yeah. I want to make sure we're not stressing people out. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to do a quick screen share here. 
um, just so that we have this quick check in. So I've got I've got my um, my vegetables chopped up, and I'm gonna uh, do this before I before I jump to the next step. Um, so we started a, a few nights ago. We started compiling a, a list of like the the tribes um, that are in the area for tribes that have uh, donation links. Um, you know, we did a little hashtag here so that people can actually uh, donate to the tribes. Um, and then um, Intertribal Council of Louisiana, um, they have a few, uh, they have a few updates. Uh, they're trying to, uh, trying to stay on top of that. Uh, Monique Verdun, who I, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, from another Gulf is possible. They actually have like a really good, like not just for people like outside, but people that um, people that go and like, you know, just want to know, like, you know, what are the supplies that I need to get to get me through the next few days? Like they'll have that on their page as well. So definitely like check out all of the, um, the donation links for all of our people that are viewing. Um, I do want to just point out that, you know, now that now that we're kind of like the sun is up and we're starting to assess. And as uh, as Haley was saying, you know, we have tribal centers that may be damaged or, you know, just houses in general. We don't know like where water is right now because, you know, we're here. We're here talking with everybody. But along the um, along the Gulf Coast, uh, we have a lot of uh, state and, and non-recognized tribes um, that, that have been there and, you know, trying to like, you know, just continue their way of life. Um, and so, you know, things like this, absolutely uh, a, a huge disruption. Um, you know, this, this storm was characterized as something that was, was life-changing um, for everybody within the, uh, within the path. Um, so, you know, for our tribes along the Gulf Coast, we want to say that the, the impacts have been even more so. Um, so definitely um, go, through, uh, go through the list of tribes um, and, you know, just uh, where you can, you know, uh, just help out. Um, you know, Haley, do you want to just kind of like, um, do you want to add anything to that while I have the list up? Yeah, I mean, um, we should definitely, I mean, this is just kind of like a, we have no um, visibility on the ground other than what we're going to talk about today. So it's not like we, I, I'm, I just want to make sure that this isn't like a all encompassing list. It's actually right. what we don't have on that. Um, there's also, you know, there's a lot of things that are really interconnected. So there's also groups that are maybe not tribal organizations that are also mutual aid networks and also people who are not necessarily categorizing people before they support them. Um, so when we're thinking about maybe emergency immediate support, um, we're thinking, I personally think mutual aid networks might be the better better way to you know get meals into people's hands. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are a lot of roofs that need to be fixed. Um, and that's not a today thing. That's the next week thing. That's, that's months from now thing. Um, mm -hmm. So whenever you're thinking about like a longer term donation of something like fixing someone's roof, um, that's something where you're, you know, where we're trying to provide this list. So you can start thinking about um, different ways to, to provide a little bit longer and a little bit deeper support. Um, I think today and probably until, you know, next Saturday, it's, it's just trying to get meals in hands and tarps on roofs and people into safe spots um, and out of the water and dry. Um, and that's, that may not necessarily be, you know, tribal groups, although they're, they're definitely uh, supporting and, and positioned to help with that. Do you agree with that, Thomas, or what do you think about that? No, yeah, while, while you were saying all of that, it, it reminds me of some of the things that I was thinking about last night because, um, you know, you go, I, at least, you know, my process, like watching, watching local news um, and then going on social media and then try, trying to follow like the personal updates and everything. Um, and then you, then you kind of like understand, like 
from the social media aspect, you understand that like there are people that have, this is not on their, this is not on their radar. This is not a part of their reality um, for, you know, to like pay attention to a historic storm uh, hidden, hidden the Gulf Coast uh, at, as it has, let alone the fact that on top of that, now they have to be confronted with something that, you know, that they, they, they should have been doing in the first place, which is like understanding whose land they're on, who their host tribes are, and then, you know, cultivating those relationships. So, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people who might be, who might be tuning in, who are outside of our community, um, you know, this is, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of educating. But this is not, this is not an educational tool. This is like, after you have the consciousness of like understanding who the, who the tribes are and, you know, where, where to direct aid. And then once you have that, I think, you know, you go even further on that community level and you understand like where those mutual aid networks are and everything. Like where, where this is a one step of the process but I think that people that really want to like support be in solidarity, like there's a lot of like, you know, ed education that people need to do in order to understand like all of those things, like, you know, <laughs> where the Gulf Coast is and who the tribes are and like what, you know, when you get down to the grassroots level, like where the, uh, where the mutual aid networks are. So yeah. lots of, lots of stuff. Um, but we hope that, you know, through this, through this broadcast, through this list, um, you know, we'll, we'll go a little ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to text so, Ida to see if, um, if they're able to hop on. Um, not right now, but just see if they're, if they're available today. Okay. Okay. So while you got that, let's see. Let me go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. No one see my face. Well, no one see my face here. There we go. Look at my floor. <laughs> So just uh, um, just in the way of kind of doing the uh, the kitchen tour here. Here are some of the ingredients. Use what you have. Some some all-purpose seasoning. Some lemon juice. Some uh, some vinegar. I use all of that to, uh, and the uh, uh, the vegetable uh, parts that I wasn't going to use. I have that going. I need to cut this uh, cut this fire down. I have like a little stock going here. I'm gonna go ahead and fire a bit. And then you can see I have the um, the beans here. Um, they've been they've been soaking. I put like a, a little bit of seasoning just to see like you know as they're soaking up that water, they can soak up a little bit of seasoning as well. Then I got my, my cast iron skillet, which I did not use soap and water to clean. <laughs> oh, no. so there, there is there is the cultivation that's happening. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna do with this. My next step, what I'm gonna do. Um, and I don't know like uh, what what your process will be, Haley, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna make a root um, and then okay. put the vegetables in. And then put the and then put the uh, the beans in. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I saw I saw some recipes that didn't have a root, so I was like, okay, <laughs> some people do that, and that's okay. But <laughs> but when, yeah. I, when I when I do when I do it, you know, I usually like, you know, that's how I take care of things. <laughs> yeah, I'm just putting onions. The way I make beans is I like brown my onions put my meat and then kind of slowly add my salt I don't, I don't think I'm even putting any vegetables other than onion I don't think I have any 
What? <laughs> Peppers work. You cut you cut out a little bit. What happened? I'm just digging in my fridge. I just found some peppers. So. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So. So, how are you? Um, how are you feeling about all this? Um, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in that unsure place with everybody. Like, um, you know, I. I, uh, we're still waiting on, you know, how, uh, how points west of, uh, of New Orleans are making out. Um, my nanan, my uncle, uh, they live, uh, they stay at Norco. Um, and we haven't really, you know, we haven't really seen like updates last night too much about like what's going on except for like you know what what some people were able to kind of make out you know in the darkness yeah um so there's there's that but you know what concerned me was like next next town over in Laplace um you know you have people going you know into their attics um and you know being um being rescued by um you know people putting the calls out to the Cajun Navy um which I, which I mentioned earlier and, um, and, and on this. So, you know, I think it's just sort of like, again, like, you know, this is, this is good right now that I'm actually uh, being active and doing something and, and communicating and, and trying to get resources out there and staying busy. Like that's, that's what's helpful for me. Um, but it's also I'm also doing this, you know, conscious of the fact that like the last update that I've allowed myself was, you know, 630 in the morning here, 530 in the morning there um, when Canal Street is completely dark, dark except for um, uh, the police lights. So, you know, we're coming coming out of darkness um, and trying to get some clarity. Yeah, I had a hard time with that this morning. I feel like um, three things. The first is that like, I realized that this is the first storm that, um, you know, I, there's a, it was like a crux of things for me. Like this is the first storm that I've, I've watched social media on. Um, so like before this, I, I felt like, you know, selfishly storms didn't really bother me too much. Um, they were either not hitting Louisiana or like not hitting a place within my community. So it was like, I heard about them, I cared about them, but it wasn't like a direct, you know, direct watching. Um, and then the other thing is that I just didn't have as many people and contacts within the cone of cone of uncertainty. Um, but in this storm, I felt like everyone I knew was in the cone of uncertainty. And that's like, it was strange to watch on social media, like the amount of content <laughs> that you're getting. Because I, you know, the last time I was in a storm, you know, the, you don't, when you're in the storm, you are in the storm and that's it. You know, like you're not checking social media, you're not out there. You're just, you know, um, usually don't even have a lot of power. So you're not able to see, or not as much internet. So you're not able to like really see what's happening. And so I felt like this was the first storm where I, I saw so many videos of the wind and the water while it was happening. I had never seen that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in other, when I, you know, younger storms like Andrew and Katrina, you know, social media wasn't as big. Um, yeah. So it wasn't, I don't think I had never really prepared myself to watch that much, you know, hurricane content. And I guess that was another thing of just like, I need to, as I stream, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, I should be on social media a little less. So it doesn't <laughs> impact me as much, but, um, but yeah. And just, so that, that was, that was a note that I had was like, how much of my stream was there and then how much of it just went silent after a while um, when people kind of were in the thick of it and, and just kind of concerned about, you know, when you weren't seeing hurricane content, it, was, it, it felt like worse, you know? And um, I'm just watching Twitter last night when I was watching, uh, you know, when La you could like watch it unfold as the, the levee broke in Laplace and then the immediate social media calls of people you know, 
hashtagging the Cajun Navy, giving them their, their, their address and letting you know where they can be found and, and how many people and how many dogs. And mm. Scrolling through that and just like taking that in was a lot for me. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to go through that. That's gotta be worse. Okay. So I'm going to I'm 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 talking I'm talking to my stove, but I need to like also project towards the uh <laughs> towards the towards the laptop. So can you can you hear me all the way over there? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> So what I'm doing right now is just, uh, I'm, I have half a cup of vegetable oil, half a cup of uh, flour, and I'm just stirring that on a medium fire. And I'm gonna just like wait until, I, when you do this, you have, your, you have your wooden spoons, but they get like, they get burnt, they get dark, and then, you know, you have kind of that little gauge there that will say like, oh, okay, that's, that's the color it's supposed to be. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna keep on staring until this gets uh, a bit, bit nice and brown. Cut the fire a little bit. Yeah, and I usually, uh, thank you for, uh, I mean, just even like just the ability to kind of like be here and talking like this, because usually what I'm doing is I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cook like on Sundays um, and like put on WWOZ and, uh, and just like kind of zone out. <laughs> It's funny because this is the same thing that ended up happening. It was gumbo, but it was the same thing that ended up happening for Mardi Gras this year. You know, um, you know, Mardi Gras was canceled, and it uh, it was really hard for for people. And what ended up happening was I, I just called people on Skype, and we made a gumbo and, and just talked and, and caught up, and it became like this this thing that happened. So it's funny that later it's for another coping or, or consideration here, we're, we're back at the pot <laughs> it's talking. Is it, um, would it then be like, can you, can you, can you talk a little bit about like what's coming up for uh, a bunch of public access? Mm. Or is that, is that a trade secret? It's not a trade secret. It just doesn't feel like what's important right now, you know? Okay. Um, you know, like we're, I, I'm definitely going to like, we're going to totally can tell you guys about that, but it just doesn't feel like this is the moment to like platform on that is more than, you know, just kind of thinking about what's happening and how we can help out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wait, wait. I'm looking, I'm just scrolling through text right now and I'm seeing that the cell and landline service is down in LaFouche, that it might be difficult to get in touch with people. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Looking through. Let me check the other your text to see what it's
I can't help but thinking that like, you know, if you're thinking back of the flood of, I think it was like, when was the flood? I think it was 1923 or 1924. Um, mm -hmm. When the Mississippi River flooded, you know, there was this, there was this. I think it was 27. Flood? I think, I think that one was 27 because. 27. Yeah, in Marksville, like, they, they always, they're always talking about the, uh, yeah, 27. Yeah. But I, from what I, I heard from people on this is that it, uh, you know, it was, it was, barreling the Mississippi River had enormous rains from you know snow melt and spring water from the north um, and it was barreling down to you know the coast and people were concerned if the levees would fail or not in New Orleans um, and so what they ended up doing was was using opening the floodgates I think in St. James to work as um, as a sacrifice zone to save New Orleans and it was just this uh it was just like in the memory of people for a very long time, the bitterness of how people, how agriculture sustained the, the state, you know, and how trade is important, but maybe not all of the business and how, uh, how easy it was for New Orleans to sacrifice, you know, um, sacrifice that part of it. And, you know, seeing that it was mostly black and brown people who were living in that area and how easy it was for people to just, um, not um not considered important uh those farmlands are not as important as as themselves and it just made me think of the you know the the structural racism that that is built in these walls and how you know how we build our walls you know that we build our walls to strategically fail in ways that you know are patterned and like, yeah. Yeah. What, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's an accident that it was La Fosse that flooded rather than New Orleans this time is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, like, uh, and, and I'm, I'm here. Um, so I have my, uh, my uh, Slave Rebellion reenactment t-shirt. Uh, from November 2019. It actually uh, started uh, just like a few blocks away from what more my uncle and my aunt and aunt stay in Norco. And we went down the, uh, the levees. Um, and, you know, and, and reenacting the, the 1811 German Coast Uprising. Uh, largest largest labor rebellion on, on the on the mainland after after the uh, the Haitian Haitian Revolution, um, so inspired by the Haitian Revolution, but um, you know having that having that experience and like being being in that space where the plantations are still there but the the landscape is also um, accented with the oil refining. Um, you know, I, I think that it, and then having to like, you know, voice out these, these chants of resistance from, from the ancestors, like it really called to mind, like, you know, we can go back, you know, 19, 1927, 1811, like all of, all of that area, um, is just kind of scarred by how little we value uh, the lives of others. Um, and it, it shows even today. Um, so yeah, so some of that, some of, the, some of what you're saying about like not being surprised about Laplace, like, you know, it's, it's some of the same, you know, it's, it's always like some of the same things and it's always like poor people, um, black and brown people like, we're always the ones that have to kind of to suffer um, for for the progress of like the overall um, experiment of, of the United States um, or and rural, and rural areas too. You know, like there's this there's this feeling of maybe not you know directly, but there's a lot of people within those areas that are just 
I feel like people feel more voiceless within rural, rural areas than they, they maybe do in larger populations. Yeah. Okay. There was one tweet that I read yesterday that was like really <laughs> frustrating. Um, it was an ex-senator from, I think from South, from Lafourche. Um, and he was saying, you know, Louisiana Senator was saying, you know, it, you know, it breaks my heart to look at people in the eye who say they're not leaving because it's a choice, but also knowing that they don't have anywhere to go or don't have anything and knowing that I can't take them with them, with me. And it upset me to read that tweet because it was like, this, you're a Senator, my dude, like, <laughs> Developing and advocating for, you know, civil infrastructure is your, should be your daily job. And if it's so far from you to understand that that is part of your job, then, you know, that, that you feel like you need to be comforted when you're brought on situations when that fails, it just, it just was upsetting. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, so much um, of what our people are going through, um, both, both around the headwaters and the mouth of the Mississippi River, up and down the river, like, I, I was I was thinking that you know all all it is to some of these people is like um, a little bit a little bit of ink on a, on a piece of paper and something is something is done. Meanwhile, like you know, our our people are 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 in harm's way, or you know some of them are resisting by by you know chaining themselves using their using their bodies to chain themselves to like machinery and i just think about like the the value from from both sides like is is all of this human life worth like you finally being convinced that you need to put something on a piece of paper with with ink like you know, how do you, how do you, how do you like, how do you like look at that value system where we're at today um, and, and really think that this is something that is like, that, that is, that's just for everybody. I, I, I can't. So. Yeah. And like, we're so far removed from seeing that that it just feels, you know, you know, it's like it takes something extremely large for it to make it make it visible just because it's it's so patterned. And just feels and it just like assumed so natural. <laughs> Another tweet that I, I heard that was um I wanted to get your opinion on John Luke, but I also like just kind of had some thoughts on was uh, someone in, in Colorado asked, uh, so we put up the list of donations of places to, to go in tribal centers and communities. Um, and someone's comment was, um, can you help me find the best one or which ones need it most? Um, and something like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to ask it this way, but I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, and I had a few like feelings around that. First of all, it was like, my first feeling was obviously anger and frustration. I was just like, you can't, you can't ask us that. But then it was like, yeah, you know, actually we put it out there because we're the people you should be asking that question to. Um, and then the other thought that I had was, you know, so what is, how would you determine that? And then the third thought that I had was, why are we living in a place where that has to be determined? You know, I'm feeling like, um, you know, after, um, after a disaster like this, something that happens really quickly is, you know, um, reporters and journalism 
kind of moves into an area to assess and communicate what's happening. Um, and people are almost, they're not looking for anything more than a, well, the only thing that is important or the only thing that we seem to value as, as like a larger community consuming media is the story. Mm -hmm. And so it makes this absurd, <laughs> you know, competition between communities of like, how do we be the most hurt by this? Um, and it stops like any kind of cohesion and healing and almost, you know, makes people pause and stay in this pain a little bit more just so that their story can get out just so that, you know, it, because it is important for the, for communities to get their story out. A, a story community versus a non-story community is like a there's a massive difference in what's what's capable. Um, you know, there's a massive difference between, you know, healing faster. And sometimes that's just individual people, you know, being held in their pain longer um, or, you know, communities like being asked to develop hyperboles of something that's already traumatic and already <laughs> terrible as it is, just because, you know, you know, some media source is trying to make a better story. Um, it, it just feels like, I feel like the question was an honest one. And I feel like it's a question that, you know, if we're playing this game, it needs to be asked. Um, but I don't think we should be playing that game. And I don't know how to get out of that game. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if, if, we if we were really honest about climate change and doing something about it, I think the um the bands of Biloxi Chittimacha, uh, Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw, especially Ile de Jean Charles uh, and, and, and Chief Albert, like that would be front page news every day. Yeah. If we really like, if the world was really like committed to like doing something to like say like the first, the first climate change refugee community is here. Um, and, you know, and because of like all of these systems, you know, there, there, are so many, there are so many different obstacles to overcome to get to like some kind of just resolution to that. But I think that, you know, it's only, it's only in these moments and Lord, Lord forgive me for, for quoting Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, but <laughs> I just remember like, one of the images from Katrina was when Oprah went down to New Orleans and she was like, you know, the band-aid is the band-aid is ripped off and you can't ignore it. But what you, what you're talking about is like when it's when we go past the moment when everybody is just kind of like, okay, you know, that things seem to be handled, you know, everything is good. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> We, we've been recovering from Katrina, we've been recovering from all of this stuff. We still have, you know, a climate change refugee community. Like that's, that's still going on. It's not like, okay, goodbye, everything is, everything is good. Um, but I think that it's what, what takes, what that takes is like all of that, the educational work from, um, from the, from the individual side, from like, you know, activist groups or, you know, what, whether it's environmental justice or racial justice, economic justice, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing all of those issues come up in, in this moment. Um, and this needs to be on all of those, all of those people's radar. And yeah, I understand like, you know, what's, what's probably preferred like you know people <laughs> one way or the other about the red cross and so you know we don't want to like you know go go that route we want to make sure that things are going going directly or we have like organizations that are very like closely closely aligned or like an indigenous led you know and but we still haven't really captured the the, the mutual aid um links with, within our list but going back to like what I said about the list is like, first of all, all these people that are having their eyes open, like they have to have their eyes open that wherever they are in this country, there is some tribe whose rights are being infringed upon. 
um once they realize that and then once they realize like you know the importance of what's happening back home right now then it's then it's upon them like why do i need to tell you who who's the best person to 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 give to like i i shouldn't be i shouldn't be making that you you should be like going um building building relationships uh, in a way that you know is like not uh, self I, I, I you know I, I, self-serving or whatever like to say like okay I'm giving I'm giving this because I can and then that's it like that that that, that doesn't work what works is like okay I know I know you're here and I want to go forward with you right <laughs> So that's not something that you can capture in a, that's something you can't, you can't capture in like a, just a, a link. Are, yeah, you, are, are you okay over there? I heard a call. Yeah, yeah, no, I just swallowed a bean wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that kind of goes back to what you're saying about, what you're saying about starting this, you know, having this conversation, it kind of goes back to the design principle of relationships over products or how, how important it is to have relations and permissions maybe more than it is to develop and create something. The other thing that I heard with what you're saying there is, you know, how, you know, when we're talking about communities, it's like, why is there, why is a story the thing that's most prized? Like when you're saying getting on people's radar and having a story or getting your story out, that's, that's a product more than it is a relationship like why why are we settling for the fact that people know that we're suffering as some as success you know or something that we should be aimed at it should be you know that's not that's not the goal that's other people maybe other people's goals but it shouldn't be our goal to create a story it should be our goal to create a change and I feel like just wanting to create a story or just being compelled to create a story from these media outlets is stopping like one step away from change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, why aren't we just aiming for change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, um, everything, I think everything that we do, when we do it in the right way, um, culturally, like, you know, if we are, if we enter a space, we have certain protocols and I, I want to like, I want to like use that language, you know, I, I think, you know, just to, just kind of like say it, like, just kind of like save ceremony as like something that's, that's something that's very specific to, to all of us. But I think that, um, aside from that that there's just that there's just protocols that you know we have to kind of have to follow when we're when we're entering into a space or like or like holding something like having dignifying like the the message in a certain way so you know and that's not something that's not something that you can have access to if you're if you're out to as you're saying like make a make a product uh, out of something like that that's not what you're um that's not what you're gonna accomplish um uh if you if you're if you're truly like sincere about like building building the relationships and 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 going forward because this is this is something that you know for all of us, I think, you know, wherever we are in the world, we always wake up and we always think about what's going on back home, what's going on with other indigenous peoples, and, you know, how can I represent where I'm from and, and build those relationships, um, at least that's my, that's my context. Like, I'm always thinking about, like, 
this is where my tribe is. This is what our history is. These are who my ancestors are. And regardless of where I go in the world, it, it never fails. Like there's always some sort of like little, little seed that's like, oh yeah, you know, there's some history behind like, you know, why I'm here or there's like relationships. And it's like constantly having to like rekindle and remind people that, you know, this is, this is who I am and this is, this is why I'm here. Does that make sense? Yeah, like the, it feels almost like, you know, as you're called, as we're asking people to cultivate relationships between, you know, these communities, there's also this bit of, it makes me think that there's also this bit of relationship cultivation between that, that you know, we should be constantly taking, which is like, the relationship between who we are, where we're from, but then also connecting that to where we are currently and you know the current state and like better defining the relationship between where we are now and you know physically, mentally, <laughs> spatially, you know, where are we versus you know who is our community and, and where are they from and what's our relationship between that and what's the relationship between the different things that we do. Mm -hmm. So that was just, when you were saying that, it was, it was, it was making me think of. All right, I'm putting my rice on. Oh, you got it. You're all the way to the rice. <laughs> I got, I got, got people to check in on. I'm, I'm just nervous about, I'm very nervous about people. I'm feeling like kind of tense being on this call right now just because it's like, I feel like I should be checking in with individuals and making sure people are okay. But there's also this sense that it's like, it is important. Like, I think talking with you and doing this through this process is, is helping me out a lot, but it's also like getting, maybe helping people better understand what people are going through and then also how to help out and stuff so i feel like i'm just kind of rushing <laughs> bean making because i'm just in the process of like okay i need to make beans and then i need to check in on people yeah, yeah well <laughs> that's the thing too you you, you, you are you, you need to um like all, all, of, all our relations, and this, this actually comes from um, my friend Bert um, at, at Penobscot Nation, Bert Polchies. Um, a recent conversation we had talking about all, all our relations, like he said that it doesn't stop with, it doesn't stop with the people, it's all of the animals and the plants and everything. Um, and so, you know, if you, even, even the, even like the food and everything, like you have to just kind of just take your time. <laughs> Sometimes like, you know, playing music for the, uh, playing music for the food and everything. Like even, even that'll help, you know, cause it's, it'll, it'll come out, you know, you might, you might, you might rush the beans and then, uh, and then you'll taste it and you'll be like, oh, Lord, you know. Nothing's worse than rushed beans. I mean, <laughs> you're right. You're right. I got to be in the, like, this has been helping me a lot. Just like better take my anxiety and put it into something that's, you know, tangible or just kind of work through process steps of like, okay, what do I need to do after beans? Yeah. <laughs> and to like focus on something else and try to, you know. Yeah. But it's, next. Yeah, but I was gonna say, like, if you wanna, if you wanna take a break at any point, if you need yeah. to, to uh, jump off and uh, take a breath, check in, check in with folks. Uh, don't rush your food. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, don't let, don't let, don't let me hold you up. What we can, what we can do, because um, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a little while. We can like take a. Um, we can take a, a, a little bit of a break while we kind of like figure out 
you know, on both of our sides where, where folks are. And I can like, I can actually put the, um, if, if you don't mind, I can like put the, uh, the playlist on that yeah. just a couple of nights ago. So let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull up the, uh, pull up the, uh, the playlist here. And my screen share. While you're doing that, can I rail on Instapot rice? So <laughs> I used to have a beautiful rice cooker. I don't know, oh. somebody gave it to me and it was it was brilliant and it was beautiful. And then I was gifted this Instapot, which is great and fantastic, but I'm finding myself missing my rice cooker. I find that although the Instapot can do a lot of things, it doesn't do rice with the same amount of care as, as other things, so. No. To let people know how I felt about rice right now. Every yeah. time at Instapot, I'm like thinking, like, oh man, I mean, you can do it. It does it very quickly, but it's not necessarily the best. You can't rush rice. You can't rush beans. So. Yeah, you can't. You can't. You can't rush rice. You can't rush beans. I do. Uh, I did take like a couple of uh, shortcuts. So uh, let's not. Let's not look at. This this logo here because it's from a Spanish company that uh, will remain nameless, but you know. Uh, the, what is that? I said I said. Well, I don't know if you remember the the, the, the brand oh. that we were boycotting that was from yeah, Spanish, yeah. Like, very popular brand. What is the what is the content though? I, I didn't see the pack when you held it up. Oh, this is, it just just parboiled rice. Oh, pre rice rice. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what that's what I usually use because it's it, it is it is very tricky and it's like let I mean rice rice itself is 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 a very tricky thing. Yeah. And how <laughs> how how much how much you cook it? How much water is in it? What? what do you what do you put in how do you cover it what where is your fire at that's all those variables and you know i i do try to like you know i do i do stick with a parboiled rice so i you know i can at least um i i get good results with that let me yeah. just if i go straight like straight like white rice or jasmine rice anything like that you know <laughs> it's <laughs> it's yeah. a Sometimes it gets a little al dente. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, um, what I'll do is I will, uh, yeah, share a screen. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put this, um, put these on. Now I put the the um, the shuffle on. So, this oh, full screen. Well, it's kind of shady. Son, where are you? But if you if I'm gonna um put it like just a little bit like so that if you need to like call at me or anything like this, oh. um, like you know, yes, hello. Um, or if you need to uh, and then we'll we'll be we'll, 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 Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad that you guys came to visit me today. Uh, my name's Greyhawk, Greyhawk Perkins. Uh, actually, I got a real weird name. My whole name is about that long. Uh, and everybody asks me, it says, Andres Tiaslo Bianake Abibioa, weird last name Perkins. But uh, I am, uh, I'm of the Muscogee Nation. 
My mother is Homa in Choctaw, and my dad is Choctaw. And uh, I grew up in New Orleans, and below New Orleans, and outside of New Orleans. And in our area, uh, in Louisiana, we have about 64,000 Native Americans. We have, uh, we have the Cushadas, we have the Chittimachas, we have the Homa, we have Choctaw. And, uh, and we all live in, 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 New Orleans, in the Louisiana area. And uh, it was really cool. In, in New Orleans area, below New Orleans, we have about 14,000 Native Americans that live there, that are Homa. And then we also have some transplant natives that live in, the, in our area. Now, I grew up in a uh, pretty much traditional native household. Uh, my grandmother was really traditional. That's who I learned a lot of my, my stories from. And, and a lot of things that I know was from my grandmother. She, and my grandfather was a great storyteller. And uh, I just grew up, as I was growing up, uh, it was just something that you did. You sat down, you listened, and they would tell you stories. Uh, and that's how we passed on what our ancestors did, and that's what I do today. Um, I remember at, I guess her age, even at three years old, uh, I would sit down and I'd have all these elders, and they would sit around the table at night, and that's what they would do, they would talk. Because at the time, we didn't really have television. You know? And even after television came along, I noticed that you know, during a time when the family got together, which was regular. I mean, you know, we all lived around each other in the community uh, that we would, uh, they would sit down and they would start telling stories and they would start talking. And I just got to the point where I would sit either under the table or right by the door and I'd start listening. And uh, I was just happy that I, I had that time. I was in that transition area in our culture in New Orleans where in 63 was the first year that Native Americans were openly allowed in public school in Louisiana. And uh, so a lot of our people were not exposed to uh, a lot of the outside world in, in a lot of ways. I lucked out, you know, I, I, we moved up into the New Orleans area and I was able to experience both cultures. Um, I still was able to be around my grandparents weekly and uh, I was still uh, able to uh, see what was going on in the outside world. And uh, so a lot of my stories have to deal with both the transition, the old traditional, and uh, a lot of stories that I see today in our communities and, and, and our kids and, uh, and people go through. And I'll use a lot of animals in my stories. I'm going to talk about uh, one of the stories, and it was funny because I, I went outside earlier and I looked at what we had around the museum, and I started looking at some of the plants. And they were starting to give me ideas of different stories that we had. And I, I looked down there, and there was a plant that I, I noticed down, downstairs. And I automatically, said, I got to tell this story. And we're going to use Samantha in this story. She, the, 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 main, the main person or the main character in the story is going to be called Samantha today. How's that sound? Pretty good? OK. Well, there was this plant this little plant, about that big, and she was so lonely. She would sit there and she'd cry all day long. Oh, I'm so lonely. And all the animals and plants would never come around her. You know why? Because the poison that she had been given to protect her was so intense, it was so strong, that if any animal or plant came by, they would get sick and they would die. And no animal or plant, even grass, would go around her. And she got so lonely. And she'd look up at the sky and say, Abba Miko, please, please, I'm so lonely. What can I do? And the creator looked down and says, what do you want? And she says, I'm lonely. I got too much poison. Nobody likes me. And the creator goes, well, what do you want to do? She says, I want to get rid of this poison. Then all the animals I can be friends with. Creator says, okay, this is what we'll do. Today, if you can find three animals that would take your poison equally, then I'll let you get rid of the poison. But if you don't find any animals before the sun goes down today, you have to keep the poison. Is that a deal? And the little plant, Samantha says, yes. It's a deal. So the creator left it at that. 
She looked up at the sky and she said, Abamiko, Abamiko, please. I want to get rid of this poison. Help me talk to all the animals. And the Abamiko said, okay. And she was able to talk to all the animals. And she said, animals, plants, I have poison to protect you if you want it. Come and get it. So she waited. She sat there and she waited and she waited. And time went by. And she's watching the sun and it's starting to move. And she gets, she's getting worried because no animals are coming. Then and finally, she sees the grass separating. It was doing this. What do you think that was? That was a snake. And it got right to the edge of the, where there was mud and no grass, and it looked over at Samantha the plant, and they said, I heard you getting rid of some of your poison. I'll take it to protect me. And Samantha the plant said, I will give you the poison if you promise me this. Snake says, whatever. I'll promise you anything I'll take if I can get the poison. Plant said, you have to warn anyone first before you bite them. You have to give them a warning. Snake thought about it. said, I can do that. It was a nice snake. So the snake said, I will do this. If animal, anything comes up to me and it looks like it's going to hurt me, I will cock my head back and open my mouth and shake my tail and they'll see the white inside of my mouth and know that if they don't back up, I'm going to bite them. Plant goes, sounds like a good deal. It's okay, I'll give you the poison. And the snake tells her, thank you, Yokoki turns around and slithers off and kept its promise. It's the cotton mouth water moccasin. When you walk up to a cotton mouth and you get close, it cocks up the whole half of its body and it cocks its head back and it just opens its mouth and you see that white inside? That means back up, because if you don't, then it's gonna get you. Kept its promise. So the plant's still sitting there. Still looking around and hoping that somebody else comes. He's still got two pieces of poison to get rid of. Well, sun's way up in the sky, and all of a sudden that little plant sees something else coming through the weeds, through the grass, and it stops, and it looks over at Samantha and says, I came to get some poison. I heard you getting rid of some poison. Could you please give it to me? I could use it to protect myself. Samantha says the same thing. I will give you the poison if you promise me that you will warn anyone before you bite them. Give them a chance. Snake then sat, about, sat down and thought about it. Sat down and thought about it and said, I got an idea. If anyone comes near me and they get close and they look like they're going to hurt me, I will rattle my tail. And if they don't back up, I'll bite them plant goes, sounds like a good deal. You can have the poison. And the snake said, thank you, Yoko Ki. Turned around and slid it off. And that snake has kept his promise. If you run up a rattlesnake and you stop and you look like you might hurt it, it's going to do this. And it'll back up. And if you don't take him back up from it, what do you think that snake's going to do to you? It's going to bite you. But that's your warning. Well, time goes by a little bit more, and that sun's just getting down in the sky, and it's about right there. And the plant is worried. Plant's worried. Because if that plant doesn't get rid of that last bit of poison, she gets it all back. She had to get rid of all of it. So, oh, the plant starts crying. The plant starts crying. And all of a sudden, through the weeds, through the grass, you see this really fast coming through but it's real small and it gets right at the edge and it says hey plant i want your poison and i want it right now the plant goes Whoa, wait a minute you are rude howling at me like that plants the little snake goes excuse me i'm here to get your poison 
I want it now. Give it to me. I know you got to get rid of it. I heard that you got to get rid of it by the end of the day or you're going to get it right back. I want it right now. And that, oh, the plant says, you are rude. I'm not giving you any of my poison. Snake looks at it and goes, you got to give me the poison. You have to give me the poison. The plant says, I don't have to give you the poison. I'm going to wait. Snake says, you can wait till the rest of the day, but nobody's going to come. And the plant says, why? Because I told every animal and plant that you got rid of the poison already. So now you got to give it to me. Oh, that was a sneaky little snake. She said, no, no, I don't believe you. He says, yep, I did. You don't see anybody coming, do you? And she sat and she said, I'm going to wait a minute. She said, I'm going to give you five minutes. I'll come back. And the snake slid it off and she waited and waited. And she goes, oh, my goodness, the sun's going down. Snake comes back. You ready to give me the poison? She says, I guess I have to, but I really don't want to, but I have to. She said, can you promise me this? He says, I'm not promising you anything. Just give me the poison. And she says, well, listen to me. If I give you the poison, will you warn anyone before you bite them? And the little snake looks at her. I'm not warning anybody. Look at me. I'm little. If they come near me, they look at me, they even look at me cross-eyed, I'm going to bite them. And she thought about it. She looked at the sun. She didn't want that poison back. So she looked at the snake and she said, Snake, it's against my best judgment, but here you go. I'll give you the poison. Snake took the poison, didn't even say thank you, turned around and left. That snake was a pygmy rattlesnake. And if you see a pygmy rattlesnake, you put your hand down, you go anywhere near, it's going to bite you. It kept its promise. It's not even going to warn you. Now all those three snakes went off and before you know it, the grass started growing around that plant and the butterflies started coming and the bees were coming and the animals were coming. She was so happy. Samantha was happy. And you know what? She became the marigold that we know now that became a plant that you can make medicine to help bites and get rid of poison. And that's the story of Samantha, the marigold, and how those three snakes got their poison. A true Muscogean tale. Thank you. I hope y'all enjoy that one. You like that? You, you know what? That's your story now. You can tell that for the rest of your life. It's the Samantha story. Yes, indeed. I like that grin. She's happy about being the marigold. All right, you want to hear another story? How about a song? You want to sing with me? Yeah. Well, I'm going to do a song. And, and here where I live, you know, we, we, we do have some drum songs. We don't have many. But we have some drum songs. But most of our song, songs are call and answer and they're done with rattles. Now, we do have a thing we call stomp dance, where the women wear rattles on their legs and the men sing and the women keep the rhythm. Well, since I don't have ladies with rattles on their legs, I'll use my rattle here. And hey, you guys, come have a seat right there. Y'all come on, sit in front. Don't be shy. Have a seat. Are y'all going to sit together there? I'm going to have to look at those dots right there? Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to get everybody to help me out. It's a call and answer. Now, usually we answer back what we're calling out. But I'm going to just get you guys to repeat what I, I, I holler out. Now, we're going to give it a test. I'm going to see, if, what's your name? What? Juliet. Juliet. And what's your name? Erica. Erica. That's Samantha. Samantha, meet Juliet and Erica. Say hi. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you, I'm going to test you. I'm going to get you, when I point at myself, I'm the only person talking. When I point this way, that means you've got to repeat me. Now, the more people that show up at our dances and sing, the more people, we, Native Americans, we don't go to any function without bringing food or gifts, mostly food. And everybody brings food. So the more people that show up, the more food shows up. And the more food shows up, the more we get to eat. Anybody like to eat? You like to eat? Yeah, all right. You don't like to eat? Oh, you like to eat. Now, if you sing real loud, you get to eat first. 
So we're going to see who gets to eat today. All right. I'm going to start. We're going to, we're going to use three words. Okay? We're going to go, yo! Yo! Woo! She's going to eat. All right. Yo! Yo! Woo! Now we got three people that are hungry. All right. Let's see if these guys are hungry. Yo! Yo! All right. Let's have everybody together. Yo! 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 Uh-huh. uh-huh. All right. Yo means yes. Your way means yes indeed. What do you think uh-huh means? Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. That's what it means. So we're going to try this song. Yo. Your turn. You got it. All right. I know what a flat tire sounds like now, I tell you. Yo! I'm by myself, I'm louder than y'all. All right. Yo! Uh huh. He ye. He ye. He ye. He ye. Ho yo. Ho yo. He ye. He ye. He ya. He ya. He he. He ye. Hey, hey, now he is. Hey, hey, he is. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. He loves not a he. He loves not a he. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. He loves not a he. He loves not a he. He loves not a he. Yo, we are. Oh, we are. And no, we are. And no, it's too much. And no, it's not a. Yo ho we ya, hello ho we ya, aha, 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 he ye, 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 he I think you're gonna have a, you're gonna eat a big lunch this evening, yeah. Hey, I went to Fud Ruckers. They got big hamburgers over there, yeah. So y'all did good. Give yourself a hand. Y'all did real good. I got another story, and you know I like to do stories about where I'm from, and that's what I do. I, I I'm I'm a southeastern native. Oh, it was a pleasure. Glad y'all came by. I'm a Southeastern native, I'm from Louisiana, and most of the, all the stories that I have deal with where I'm from. Uh, I'm gonna do two stories for you guys. One of them is about Lake Pontchartrain. It wasn't called Lake Pontchartrain a long time ago. We just called it a big old pond. Now, a long time ago there was this big pond. We call it Lake Pontchartrain now. And we had catfish in that pond. And those catfish were huge. They were big. Well, one day, the cat, Miko catfish was our leader. Miko catfish, he would swim every day. And he'd go over to the north side of that big pond and go, Hey, catfish, how you doing today? And the catfish would reply and they'd say, We're doing just fine. And Miko would say, Do you need anything? And the catfish said, no, we got everything we need. Oh, we, you know, we're perfect. And Miko, well, leaders like to hear that. And he said, good, I'll see you tomorrow. And he'd take off. And he went over to the north side, the south side, the east side, and the west side of that big old pond. And that's what he'd do. He asked if everybody was, and usually they were all okay. They didn't need anything. Well, days and days went by. And he was making his rounds again. When we got to that south side of that lake, he asked the fish, the catfish, how you doing? They were fine. Then he swam to the north side of that lake. But something made him stop. He heard this sound. And the water was vibrating. And he was going, ooh, I wonder what that is. And the catfish were waiting for him to ask the question. He said, no, no, wait a minute. Stay where you're at. I hear something. I feel something. I'm going up to check this out. 
and he swims up to the top. He gets to the top of the water, and he looks out over the land, and he sees the trees, and he sees something big running straight for that big old pond, full speed. It was running full speed. And as he's watching, it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, and he goes, whoo! If that thing don't stop and it hits this water, whew, we're going to be swinging in the trees tonight. That thing hits this water. So he swims back down. He tells all the catfish, he says, catfish, they say, what? He says, they got something big coming, and it's running fast, and it looks like it's not going to stop, and it hits the water. We're going to be swinging off the trees and the moon tonight. And he tells all the catfish, I want you to take your catfish teeth, and I want you to clamp on to the grass. That way you won't fly in the air. So all the catfish do that. Do this. They clamp down. And they said, okay, we'll be, we're ready. So he swims back up to the top. He gets to the top, that thing is close, and he finally gets to see what it was. It was moving fast. It was running. It was running as fast as it could. He saw it. It was the biggest. It was the meanest. It was the hairiest, ugliest thing he ever seen in his life. It was the biggest buffalo he ever seen in his life. He was a catfish. It was a, probably the first buffalo he ever seen in his life. But it was running straight for that big old pond. And, Kat, and, and Miko goes, uh-oh. He goes on top of the water, and this thing's running straight for him. If he hits that pond, where's Miko going to wind up? In the trees. Big old splash. Miko goes, oh! And Miko closes his eyes, and he braces himself for the impact of that buffalo. And that buffalo's coming. That buffalo's running. He's running straight for that pond. He gets right by the edge of that pond, and right when he gets right there in the pond, he hits that pond, and he stops. Good breaks. He stops at the edge of that pond and he goes, Woo! I am hot. I am tired. I am sweaty. And I don't smell too good. I think, you know what? I'll get some water. I'm going to get some water. And Miko's still like this because he's thinking that, that big old buffalo is going to hit the water. And he stops and he looks up and there's that buffalo right there. And he listens to the buffalo. The buffalo says, I'm going to drink me some water. And the buffalo sticks his head down in the water and goes, <sniffs> starts drinking that water, and the water level just starts going down. And Miko goes, oh, my goodness, if that big buffalo don't stop drinking this water, we ain't got no place to live. And finally, the buffalo stops. The buffalo said, I'm not thirsty no more, but I'm still hot and I'm sweaty, and I still don't smell too good. Buffalo looks at that water, whoo, that's going to feel good. And the buffalo jumps right in that water and starts going back and forth and back and forth and back, just like a big old buffalo washing machine. Whoa, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Miko's riding the wave screaming, whoo! And finally the buffalo stops, gets out of the water and shakes off. But boy, that water is dirty now. And it don't smell too good. Ooh, Miko was upset. And Buffalo's getting ready to walk off. And Catfish goes, hey! Buffalo goes, huh? Catfish says, me, I'm talking to you. Hey! And Buffalo turns around and looks down at Catfish, and he says, huh? Catfish, the nerve of you! Coming here, drinking our water, jumping in, dirty and all. You didn't even say please, thank you, or nothing. That you could even, even ask. And the buffalo turned around and went, huh, and walked off like nothing happened. Ooh, that Miko got mad. That catfish got so mad. That catfish got so mad he almost turned into a redfish. That's how mad he got. But he calmed down. Because he had to think about all those catfish. He's a leader. He had to think about all those catfish, and maybe they got hurt. So he swims back down. He gets back down to the water, and boy, them catfish, they've been holding on. 
But boy, they shaking up. And he asked them if they were all right, and they said, yeah, we're all right, we're just a little shaking up. And the water was so cloudy because of the buffalo making the, the dirt come up and all. And Miko said, what am I going to do if that buffalo comes back and does that again? We won't be able to live here. Miko starts thinking, what am I going to Oh, he got an idea. He told all the catfish, get a good night's sleep in case that buffalo comes back. I got an idea. He says, when that buffalo comes back, every, every catfish get on the bank of the, of, the, of the big lake, big pond. And when that buffalo jumps in the water, catfish got something a lot of fish don't have. They got stingers. And when that big old buffalo jumps in the water, we're going to sting him. You got 10,000 catfish jumping on you, you're going to get stung. So that night, they all get a good night's sleep. They wake up the next morning, they get along the bank of that big old, big old lake. Guess who showed up? Who do you think showed up? Buffalo, Buffalo showed up. Buffalo showed up, he's running. Y'all come sit down, he's running. He gets to the edge of that big pond. He does it again, he looks up, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm all this. And he jumps in the water and he starts to roll around. But this time, he's got a surprise. 10,000 catfish jump on him. And they sting him in the head. They sting him in the eye. They sting him in the thigh. They stung him everywhere. And that buffalo jumped up going, Woo! And he looked over. And guess what he saw? Big old Miko catfish. Tell him, get off! So buffalo looks at that catfish as the leader. And he takes that big old hoof and he goes right on that catfish's head. And he looked at all the other catfish and before he got out that water, he hit every catfish on top of the head. Then he jumped out the water and he took off running. And as he was going out of sight, you could hear him say these words. I ain't never coming back here. Them catfish are crazy. Now, ever since that day, if you come to Louisiana and you look out, you don't see no buffalo. Now, also, ever since that day, if you ever in Louisiana and you throw a line in the water and you pull out a catfish, check out that catfish's head. It's flat right on the top because that's the day catfish became flat-headed and that's the day there ain't no buffalo in Louisiana and that's a true Muscogean story. Thank you very much. So now you know why catfish got flat head and there ain't no buffalo in Louisiana. Yeah. That's an old story. We, I, grew, I learned that one growing up, and I love that story. That's a pretty cool. So thank you to, uh, to Greyhawk for uh, for all of the stories and everything. I'm just kind of tuning back in to some of the cooking for just a minute. Um, this is in the cast iron skillet. I have the red beans. I have some two, two tablespoons of butter. I'm just gonna, um, as, this is, as this is cooking, as these beans are getting softer, I'm gonna add a little bit of seasoning to it, make sure that it's, that it's nice, it has like a good flavor to it, it has enough salt to it. Um, also, uh, right here in this pot, I added the, uh, the parboil rice. So I, I did like a, a coat, I covered the bottom with some, uh, with some of the unsalted butter. Then I put the uh, two cups of the, uh, the parboiled rice in here. And then on top of that, I added four cups of the vegetable stock that we made earlier. So that, that rice is doing, and then uh, the beans are doing. Sometimes, sometimes up here, I'll, I'll cook the, uh, the beans and the rice together, but we'll, 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 do, them, we'll do them separate for this time. So, I'm gonna go back. Uh, I wanna uh, I wanna thank Haley. Uh, we do have like a couple of uh,
couple of other people, perhaps uh, one to check in. Um, so definitely want to thank Haley for the time. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with everybody until this until this is ready. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna kind of mix uh, between myself cooking, and then we're gonna do some of the storytelling as well. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my screen share here. We heard from Greyhawk. I want to um, bring in a couple of other tribes in here. Let's actually start with let's start with let's start with a a, a water song by Morning Dove. So I'm going to uh, start the screen share back up again. Get back to Zoom. This is me. Uh, no producers. No producers. Just me. Share. I'm gonna we're gonna go to uh to Morning Dove for this one. imagine what this chief is going through. As far as I'm concerned, she's a hero. And as far as I'm concerned, it takes somebody pretty, without very much upstairs, to not even want to speak to her. I mean, she's a woman. Don't they realize that their mom at one time was a woman too, out of respect for female, which we say is life givers? She didn't say she ha they had to do what she wanted them to do. She just wanted to at least to be heard. And I think it's pretty sad that a people that's trying to rule a country won't even give a woman a little bit of their time. That's the right. So this is a water song.
cool story. And I got another one. I said that, you, you guys are giving me these ideas. Yeah, I'm, I've been a storyteller all my life, actually. My grandpa was funny. He didn't talk to a lot of people, but when he did, he would sit down and he would share stories, mostly with us, with the kids. And my grandpa one time, I remember, pulled me over. I was a little bitty old kid. And he said, come here. And he would sit down, he would talk to me, and he would tell me a story. Usually them stories were 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes long, sometimes an hour, depending on how, how long his story is. But one day he comes up to me and he says, sit down. And he told me the story it was five minutes long. And I sat there and listened. He said, go play. I found that strange. Five-minute story, you can go play. Later on that day, he's sitting outside again. He calls me over. He said, come here. You know that story I told you this morning? Tell me that story. Man, I told him that story back. It was 45 minutes long. He looked at me and smiled and said, you're going to be a storyteller. The thing I learned from it, you get a story. No matter how long it is or short, you take and you turn, take all the things that you learned and the lessons that you learned, and you put it in those stories, and you make your stories teaching lessons, teaching stories. And that's the way our people did it. We'd look at things, we'd hear stuff, and we'd start putting our own lives into those stories and lessons that we learned, and we became teachers, not only storytellers, but teachers through our stories. And that's the way I do it. I've been doing it most of my life now. And you know what? I'm going to do this. I got a lot of stories. I'm going to tell, let's see, what we got here? We got, we got Samantha, we got, what was your name again? Erica. Erica, and who we got here? Juliet. Juliet, I can't forget that one, Juliet. Okay, who we got here? Oh, I like that, she's becoming part of my crew here. What's your name? Molly is six and Molly's in first grade. Molly is six and Molly's in first grade. I love it. I teach kindergarten, so, you know, I'm right below you there, but I'll be in first grade one day. All right. Let's see. We're going to think about a really good story. Let's see. I'm going to let you pick. I got so many stories in my head. Sometimes they, there's so many that I don't know which one to pick unless you tell me to pick one. Let's see. I'm going to name some animals. Um, we got alligators. We already told a snake story. We got rabbits. We got possums. We got all kinds of stuff. Alligators. Somebody wants al everybody wants an alligator story? Oh, I got a great alligator story. I'll give you two alligator stories for the price of one. How's that sound? I'll give you one that happened to me, and I'll give you one that happened a long time ago. Which one do you want? You want the one that happened to me first, or you want the one that happened a long time ago first? What was that? A long time ago. And what's your name again? Ella. Ella. Oh, Ella, that's a pretty, you know, all these pretty names, I love that, you know. Who's that little young girl out back there? <laughs> Julie? Julia. Julia. Oh, they wrote a lot of songs about Julia, I tell you. Now, let's give you the one long time ago about an alligator. Oh, it was a pleasure. Samantha, it has been a pleasure meeting you. You are just one unbelievably adorable, gorgeous young lady. Yes. All right. It's a pleasure. I'm glad y'all made it. Glad y'all made it. Now, alligator story. Long time ago, there was an alligator. He wasn't like the alligator we know today. This alligator was big, but his skin wasn't all bumpy and crinkly like it looks today. It was smooth and nice and tan, and oh, he just thought he was the best thing in the world. That alligator would sit on that bank, he was looking around. Anybody that came by, he'd eat them or beat them up. He was a bully. Anybody like bullies? Nah, we don't like bullies. He was a bully, and he would do that, and everybody left him alone because he thought he was the best thing in the whole swamps of Louisiana. Well, he laid there one day, and he went to sleep, and he's snoring. 
And all of a sudden he hears a sound. What's your name again? Ella. Ella. He hears a sound, and it's right here, about two feet from him in the high grass, and it's going. <laughs> and it was Ella. <laughs> she was a little rabbit. Ella the little rabbit, right there. And she was drinking up the water out that by you. And alligator goes, hey! And Ella goes, oh! And she looks over through the grass, and guess who she sees? That big alligator. And the alligator looks at Ella and says, Ella? He didn't know her name, but I'm telling you that. He says, rabbit, why are you waking me up with all that noise? Was she making a lot of noise? She was just drinking. She goes, what? He says, you woke me up from my beauty nap. I'm going to get a wrinkle. And I don't want no wrinkle. Rabbit. And Ella goes, Ooh, what were you doing? She says, I was drinking water. Oh, you were drinking water out of my bayou? Out of my water? Uh-uh-uh. You woke me up. You know what? When I get woken up from my sleep, I'm angry. I'm tired. I'm cross. And I'm hungry. You know what I'd like to eat right now? Rabbit? What do you think he, should, he would like to eat right now? Rabbit. No, Ella told him. He says he asked Ella. Ella, or rabbit, what do you think I'd like to eat? And Ella went, hamburger? <laughs> Alligator said, I don't want to eat no hamburger, rabbit. What do you think I want to eat, rabbit? And Ella went, deer? Alligator said, I don't want to eat no deer, rabbit. What do you think I want to eat, rabbit? And Ella went, possum? She didn't want to say that word, rabbit. But the alligator looked at it and said, I want to eat rabbit right now, rabbit. And Ella went, ooh, her nose started twinkling, her hind legs were doing this. Now, everybody thinks that Ella could have just ran away. You don't know alligators that well. Alligators are fast. They'll run people down. I've been treed by them before. They're fast on a straight run. You can't beat them. And that, that rabbit was right there, and there's no way that rabbit would have got away. Now, rabbit, though, Ella, she was smart. She was a trickster. She looked over at that alligator and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, alligator. I, got, I, I know why I came here. Alligator looked at her and said, you said you came here to drink my water. No, 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 no. I got water, but I came here for another reason. Because you see, Ella knew that he was a bully and that he thought he was the best thing in the world. And that's what bullies think. If they think somebody's better than them, they get angry. She said, I came here to tell you that there's another creature out in those woods over there in them swamps that told me to come here and tell you he's bigger, better, and smarter and everything than you are. You think that alligator liked hearing that? Mm -mm. That alligator said, tell that creature to come here. And Ella said, what? She said, he said, go get that creature and tell him to come here. I'll go get him. She could get away now, right? Yeah. So she turned around to run off and she said, uh, 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 not that easy. That alligator has eaten half my family, beat up half my friends, and been a bully for a long time. I'm going to teach that alligator a lesson. Now, how is a rabbit going to teach an alligator a lesson? She's smart. She's got brains. And she's a trickster. She looks at the alligator and says, nope, can't go get him. The alligator says, what? Can't go get him. He's not going to come here. You got to go to him. I got to go to him. Oh, no, no. He's bigger, badder. He's better than you. He's smarter. And he said, if you want to go see him, you got to go to him. Alligator said, bring me there. And Ella starts running. Now, alligators are good on a straight run. But if you zigzag, they're not that great. And Ella, boy, she was going to make that alligator hurt. She went in and out the big cypress knees and the trees. And he couldn't make those bends. And he'd, boom, run into the tree. Boom, run into the bushes. Boom, his nose was bleeding, and now Ella was running, looking back, going, hee, 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 hee. She was laughing, and she, she stopped. She says, hey, alligator, what's the matter? You can't keep up with me? Whoo, 
that made that alligator mad. He ran even faster and beat those trees up with his nose even more. Then they got to the high grass in the marsh. And she told him this, stop right here in the high grass. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get him. Alligator's rubbing his nose like this. Okay, go get him. I'm ready for him now. Ella starts to walk off. And Ella stops. And she turns around and she looks at him. She says, Alligator, I forgot to tell you one thing. What you forgot to tell me, the alligator says. I forgot to tell you that when that big creature gets mad, fire comes out of his mouth. Alligator goes, excuse me? Fire comes out of his mouth? Oh, yeah, when he gets mad. And all of a sudden, alligator looks up, and there's birds in the trees, animals in the trees, and they're all watching to see if alligator's going to back down. The bully. Alligator looks up and says, I ain't worried about that fire. Go get that creature. I'm not worried about that fire. Ella says, okay. She starts to run. She stops again. She turns around. She says, I forgot to tell you one more thing. Alligator says, what? I forgot to tell you, when he gets really mad, his teeth get real long and sharp. Alligator goes, mm. his teeth get real long and sharp. Fire comes out of his mouth. And Ella goes, yeah, I'm going to go get him. And the alligator starts to stop her. And looks up, and there's more animals around. So he can't show that he's scared. And she said, I'm going to go get him. He says, oh, 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 okay, oh, okay. But he wasn't so mean this time. And right as she's gone, she knows she's getting him. She turns around and says, oh, forgot to tell you one more thing. He goes, oh, no, not one more thing. Oh, yeah, 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 one more thing. When he gets real mad, his nails get real long, and he's got wings that come out of his back. Alligator looks around, and there's more animals in the trees. The alligator says, uh, uh, oh, wait, wait, rabbit, rabbit, I, I got an idea. I got I to gotta go somewhere. Uh, could you just tell him I'll come back later? Oh, no, no problem, no problem. I'll get him. He'll be here real quick, real quick. Uh, uh, well, he might be busy. No, no, he's not busy. I'm going to go get him. I'll be right back. And she runs off. She goes to the back of the high grass, and she starts rolling on the grass and laughing because there ain't no such creature as that. She made it all up. He's in there shaking. Ooh, ooh. That big creature's going to come. He's going to burn me up. He's going to drag me in the sky. He's going to eat me. Oh, my goodness. And he looks up at the sky. And he says, hey, Abamico, creator, i got to ask you a favor. I promise, I promise, if you let me out of this thing, I will be the best alligator in the world. I will never bite, hurt, or eat anybody up before, unless I'm hungry. He don't hear no sound. You see, when people get in, and animals get in a jam, and they, all of a sudden everything's going good for them, and all of a sudden they get in a jam, they start saying, please help me, please help me. But he didn't think about that until now. Well, nothing showed up, and he's still sitting in that grass. Rabbit hollers out, hey, alligator, I told him what you said. And he's mad. He's real mad. In fact, he's burning everything up. And a rabbit had taken and started a fire in that high, dry grass. And the fire started around that alligator. Before alligator could run, he was surrounded by fire. And the rabbit said, have a good day, alligator. I'll see you later. And she took off. Well, the fire came around that big old alligator, and it covered that alligator up. That alligator screamed and started running through that fire. Closed his eyes and ran through that fire and did not stop till he got back to the bayou and he jumped in. And when he jumped in, you could hear his skin go shh because he was all burnt up. Now he laid in that water for a long time. And then finally, he crawled up underneath the ledge in the mud and just laid there and went to sleep because that mud felt good on his burnt body. After a long time he'd been sleeping, he swam out from under that ledge and got on the bank and he looked at his arms and he looked at his body and it was all crinkly and it was all, oh, it didn't look like it did before. Oh, he cried himself to sleep. 
He laid on that bank for a long time crying. He laid on that bank for a long time sleeping. Then finally, after a long time, you know who showed up again? Listen to this. Who showed up? Rabbit showed up. And alligator thought he was dreaming. And he goes, who's drinking? And he looks at his rabbit. He said, rabbit, drink all the water you want. And he jumped in the bayou. Ever since that day, if you go in the swamps of Louisiana, you see that alligator come up, and they look around. And if you make any sharp noises or throw something in the water, they go whew, underneath. Because they still think that fire creature's out there in that swamp looking for them. And that's why alligators today are a lot more nicer. They don't bite people unless they, they're hungry. And anything bigger than they are, they leave them alone. And that's a true Choctaw story. Y'all like that story? Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad y'all did. All right. Wonderful. I hope y'all are uh, enjoying uh, some of the stories uh, shared by Greyhawk, some of the, uh, some of the music uh, that we've been listening to. Uh, Tikach, uh, Morning Dove, Yakoke, uh, Chito, uh, Morning Dove, uh, Greyhawk, uh, all of our, all of our beautiful family who are, uh, right now, um, you know, just the, just the purpose of this stream, um, and thank you to Babansha Public Access. So, um, if you're, if you're just tuning in, um, or just to just a reminder, if you've been here with us for a while, um, this is part cooking show, part call in. Um, just anybody that um, you know. Hopefully, we have uh, people that uh, are not in harm's way, or people that um, have checked in on family. We want to make sure that we take care of life and. Um, we, we want to make sure that we take care of life first um, before anything else. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, the stream for Hurricane Ida um, and when it made landfall um, in the past 24 hours, uh, it was uh, nearing a, a category five storm, um, winds uh, over 150, um, um, miles per hour and um, a, a kind of storm that we haven't seen uh, since 1850s. Um, so we just want to uh, just kind of call into mind like all of the um, all of the people that are down there that are just now with the morning light, you know, they're able to to go out, um, assess um, if they if they have remained in place. Uh, some of our family members have uh, have evacuated, and you know they're just kind of waiting to see, you know, if they can get back in the area and, and just do, um, just do that assessment, do that sort of like, you know, what's what's going on back at home? Um, is is there a home to go back to? Um, and then how, you know, either way it goes, like how do we rebuild? How do we um, how do we continue on from there? Um, but most especially, you know, we want to like definitely highlight, you know, for, for Southeast Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, uh, a lot of our tribes um, within that region are, are either state recognized or non-recognized. Um, and so that's not to, that's not to say, you know, uh, that's not to that's not to like evoke like you know um, some hierarchy or whatever. That's that's to say that uh, there is a system that um, that we have to navigate to uh, to do what we have to do to keep ourselves alive, healthy, thriving, uh, continue on um, in our cultures and our in our ways of knowing. So. Um, you know, all of that, all of that together, all of the challenges that, that our people are facing, uh, just to continue uh, to be uh, who they are. Um, 
from my from my own family. So my my grandfather was um, Joseph L. C. Preet Jr., uh, first tribal chairman of the Tunica Biloxi. My uh, great grandfather was um, Joseph L. C. Preet Sr., um, our last traditional chief of the Tunica Biloxi tribe uh, and medicine man. Um, and you know that that means something. I was born. Um, at a time when we had the Native American Religious Freedom Act um, passed here um, in the United States. Up until that time, um, our ceremonies were outlawed. Um, our languages were outlawed. Um, dressing the way that we do um, is outlawed. Um, and for all of that, you know, we have uh, a legacy of violence against our people, um, not just what we're focusing on today, uh, the healing um, and, and the worries that, that, we're, that we're trying to like, you know, center, uh, but there's broader impacts, um, issues about murdered and missing indigenous women, um, issues surrounding uh, the residential and boarding schools across uh, Turtle Island, uh, so-called North America. So in all of these instances, you have a person um, standing up for who they are, uh, standing up uh, for where they come from. So, you know, in this, in this, in this broadcast, we hope that you walk away if you are if you're part of our a part of our family if you're one of my cousins um you know i hope that you find some find some peace in some of the stories that we're doing while i'm you know attempting to make my version of red beans i know how some of y'all talk <laughs> um and yeah no, I, I really, I really hope that you know this is this is part of your healing process while you're while you're assessing how to continue. Um, for those of you that are just now, you know, once again, your eyes are open to um, to the to the uh, rising sea levels, coastal erosion, climate change that has affected our lands um, in Louisiana. Um, and that, that, that Band-Aid that I, I talked about before, like that has been ripped off. So you can't ignore that in this moment. Uh, what we hope that you uh, walk away from this experience of listening to all of this and listening to me ramble right now is that you actually intentionally um, go, to, uh, go to the people that are the most impacted uh, center their voices, center their experiences, um, and let them let them lead. There's no, there's no. I can't tell you what's what's right or wrong um, going forward in the process, but it's on everybody um, outside of our community uh, to build trust with our people and uh, help us go forward together. Whether that's environmental justice economic justice, racial justice, all of that. So on the cooking front, <laughs> uh, the rice seems to be okay. Uh, I, I, seem to have, I seem to have navigated that pretty well. Uh, the beans need a little bit more time. Um, so I'm gonna stay on for maybe another uh, half hour. We're gonna go back to some of the stories I'm going to put the, um, the screen back up again. Um, and hopefully you'll see me uh, at the end of this, at the end of this cast, eating, eating some red beans and, and not lying to you saying that it's good because they will be good because I spent a lot of time on that. I'm very sensitive about my cooking. So <laughs> let's, uh, going to go from Greyhawk. Oh, I want to, um, Actually, I want to hear from uh, Eli Langley. Oh, actually, let's uh, yeah, let's go Eli Langley first. So, 
We'll go ahead, cue that up. This is a CBC podcast. Hey, I'm Michelle Parisi. The woman behind Alone, a love story. Season three is coming out on February 5th. Love, sex, travel, motherhood, it's all in there. You don't expect anything less from me by now, do you? So put on some tea, make some space under the blankets, and get ready to hunker down with the final season of Alone, a Love Story. Ani Nejain, how are you? Gonalonkwa, which is I love you. Agamemok, keep going. Dayan Tilei, for don't touch. This is First Words, an indigenous language podcast by Unreserved. Yat e, which is a greeting. Miigwech, which means thank you. Jaholchevo Eli Langleika, Anna Boti, Boti Otosago Mill, Bertney Langleika Otosago Mill. Linda Langley got Otrosigo Mill. My name is Eli Langley. I am Bertney Langley's son. I am Linda Langley's son. I'm from Elton, Louisiana. I'm a member of the Cushada tribe of Louisiana. I just got Harvard University to recognize my endangered indigenous language. And I feel amazing. Ayixa. Uh, Ayixa means clan. In in the tribe, there are seven clans, all of which are, are animals. And clans are essentially family units in the tribe. The clan is passed through your mother. So for me, my father is Kashada and my mother is not Kashada. So I don't have a clan. But my my father is Bobcat. My grandmother, his mother, was Bobcat. So I would tell people, uh, which means I don't have a clan, but I'm a white Bobcat. After my senior year of high school, in the summer of 2016, uh, in, the, in our tribal heritage department, we did an immersion program. The, the passion... That I that I had for for wanting to learn the language and like kind of I ended up really eating it up and <clears throat> being really committed to to the effort. And even two, three, four years ago, a large portion of the community thought that you couldn't learn the language as a second language. If you learned English first, there was no chance for you to learn Kosati. So the immersion program was probably the starting point for me um, gaining a significant amount of fluency. There are maybe 200 to 300 uh, Kawasati speakers, and of that group, I, at 20 years old, am the youngest speaker of this language. If I don't teach my children, or if I don't continue advocating for, for this and attempting to uh, save our language in this way, there's a possibility that I will be the last person that ever speaks this language, which is... Uh, a really heavy thing to think, but um, life is long, and I'm committed to to making sure that that is not the case. There are a lot of terms in Kawasati that I really like. <clears throat> the, the one that uh, has stuck with me the most uh, in my process of learning the language is probably itachaki, uh, which means brother. But the two parts of the word are itta, which kind of means together, and achaki, which means to go along with. So an almost more literal translation of that word would be someone who goes along with you. And I think that's really beautiful. Almost a a literal um, idea of what it means to be a brother um, or a sibling is, you know, a person that will follow, will follow you, will go with you um, and stick, stick with you, I guess through the, the thick and thin. In English, a lot of the emphasis is on the nouns and adjectives, whereas in Kawasati, the entire language is based on verbs. So the word for chair is pachakoka, which means what you sit on. The word for table is paolimpa, which is what we eat on. So itachaki, I think, is a really beautiful shorthand for how we think. 
whenever I got to Harvard in the fall of 2016, I was really hot on the language. I had like dedicated my whole summer to learning it. Uh, I felt really, really good about my progress. I was basically totally conversational by the time I left home. I was considering doing it as a fifth class, an independent study, anything like that. But I was met with a lot of well-meaning people running me around, basically. I was told a lot about the handbook, the bylaws, the faculty rulings on this kind of stuff, and basically told that there was no way to go forward with what I was hoping to go forward with, was told to take other languages. There is no good justification for Harvard saying this language is worthy of recognition and it matters, and this other language here isn't worthy of recognition and doesn't matter. So about a month and a half ago, um, I received word that that we would be able to move forward with uh, an examination in Koasadi. And then shortly after that, um, I received word from uh, the registrar's office that my record had been updated, my transcript had been updated to say that um, I had fulfilled the language requirement in Koasadi. And that was just the most amazing feeling. Hi, my name is Eli Langley, and your words of the day are Itachaki, which means brother, Ayeksa, which means clan, and Abachakole, which means God. For more... Uh, <clears throat> jump in really quickly while we're watching um, Angela Como um, do some bead work. I um, just want to uh, just like, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think that this is actually kind of uh, uh, the, tone, the tone of the day that we have to kind of take things, take things slow take things uh, one thing at a time, listen to me while I, <laughs> while I'm trying to, while I'm trying to, you know, produce this, produce this live stream and get the word out and everything. And, um, but I think it's, uh, I think it's beautiful to kind of like just sit here um, and watch um, as Angela just strings these beads, you know, one at a time. And uh, it makes me, it makes me think about uh, my time um, in our, uh, in our tri tribal center, in our, um, in our museum. And I would sit with, uh, with my great aunts um, and, you know, either they'd be doing bead work or um, doing basketry. Um, we have several different techniques, um, you know, the beads, the beads come from, uh, somewhere, the, uh, the long needle, uh, uh the long needle pine, ne the, the long pine needles that we use, uh, for baskets, um, which my great aunts, uh, learned by the way of, uh, trading with, uh, with Kushada community members. And um, also we have our split cane basketry, uh, which at a time uh, we couldn't do because of, uh, because of either over harvesting, not necessarily by us, but by others, um, or even just kind of clearing the land uh, for more 
um, more expand. It's, it's hard to say like urban expansion and in, in, in Marksville, Louisiana, but Marksville is a city. So yeah, urban expansion, just further, um, further colonization of the land. So yeah, so I just, uh, just invite you, we're gonna uh, spend, uh, I'm gonna stop rambling for a few minutes and we're just gonna spend uh, uh, about uh, five minutes or so just watching uh, Angela uh, do some deep work. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, even in this form of presence. Uh, thanking all of our community members um, in Louisiana today. Thank you for being here, even in this form of presence. We're calling them all in because uh, we need to uplift us, uh, everyone. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Talk soon.
So, um, thank you, Tika, Shekoke, and Twitch, all of the. My mama used to, uh, <laughs> my mama used to make me say hello and thank you and all of that and all the language that languages that we knew, um, because uh, it just showed like you know, all the different people that we were, that we we're attached to, you know, whether it's uh, uh, grandparents or great grandparents. Um, that spoke, that spoke uh, Choctaw or, or Tunica uh, or Biloxi um, or Mobilian trade language, um, or even like the, the, the French of the, the area, uh, Louisiana French, uh, as, as we call it um uh spanish vietnamese uh all all of those all of those things all of the different the gifts of like uh languages and connections so uh very happy to um very happy to make all of those connections i think the um we're almost there <laughs> so my uh my guesstimate of of uh, nine to nine to noon here, uh, eight to eleven there. Like that seems to be kind of um, seems to be okay. <laughs> well, on time. So I wanna uh, just pause the um, just pause the the video here. I'm gonna go back. I will go back and do like a, another screen share just so we have the, uh, the relief doc up. Again, a bit of context. This is this is you know um, the the attempt that we had within the last uh, forty eight hours to kind of um, consolidate like who tribes are. If they are uh, donation links, we want to make sure that those are out there. Uh, another golf is possible, Monique Verdun, Tikachi um, Koke for your for your work. Definitely look up another golf is uh, possible. They have uh, a much more extensive list, especially for our community members uh, who are uh, who are in um, the the impacted areas. Uh, you know there are lists of supplies and everything that you need. So, um, so really, you know, want to say, you know, really go to another golf as possible, um, see what resources are there, uh, and donate, uh, you know, spread, uh, spread as much as you can, so show as much love and support as you can for all of our impacted communities, but don't let, you know, your dollar be the only thing that you do. Um, you have to start um, understanding where you are, whose land or who stewarded the land where you are, uh, and start the conversation from there. Um, because we're all connected in some kind of way, whether it's through the earth, whether it's through each other, whether it's through the water, everything. This is about relationship building. This is not just about throwing your money at a problem. This is about um, making connections uh, and understanding people where they are. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm bring back in um, the Sage from Wabanaki Public Health. Um, hello, once again, my name is Jean-Luc Perit. <laughs> member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe. I haven't, actually haven't said that for a few hours, so I hope everybody knows who I am by this point. Um, member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe and, and president of the North American Indian Center of Boston, um, Tikach uh, Wabanaki Public Health for this medicine uh, that I'm about to share with everybody. Um, also uh, from the Wabanaki Public Health, I actually have uh, this rattle, uh, which was handcrafted uh, by Mi'kmaq artisan. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a bit of do a little bit more uh, smudging just to kind of help bring us back and uh, kind of close us out a bit. 
still got a couple more things to do, but you know, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Stay with me. Thank you for this day. We thank you for um, the gift of life, um, all of the gifts um, that you have laid before us, all of the people that are uh, still with us, um, not just through these storms, but through the ongoing pandemic for all of the injustices in our world, all of the problems that us as humans that we've created for ourselves, understanding not just our connection to each other as indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples, but our connection to all of our relations, all of the animals, all the plants, the earth, the water, everything. We ask that those that could not be with us here today, and even those that were with us today sharing their voices, we ask that you watch over them, that they're protected, they have what they need to assess and to carry on. To be able to protect the land and the waters in their way. And then have a had a message to give to the sun. So he gave this message to his friend the bear, but the bear could only go up the highest mountain. And so the bear went all the way up the highest mountain. They got to the highest tree on that high mountain. And when he got there, the bear called out to his friend the eagle. And the bear gave the eagle the man's message. And the eagle, when she took the message, she flew all the way to the sky, all the way to the sun. And when she got there, the eagle gave the sun the Indian's message. And the sun, when she got the message, she reached out, she plucked the feather from the eagle, she kissed it, 
he scorched the tip black and said, you will give this back to them. Tell them to wear it. And tell them, as long as there is a sun, it will always be the Indian people. So, Tikach, uh, Heli Dardar, Tikach, um, Babancha Public Access. Um, thank you to all of our cousins that are down there. Uh, Ida Ronson, um, uh, Monique Verdan, um, our cousins that are outside, uh, Robert Caldwell here in Massachusetts, Andrew Jolivet. Um, all of us are here together in this space. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, I'm gonna put it on uh, somebody else to do some sharing. Uh, then I'm gonna plate up some of this stuff. Hopefully I didn't burn the beans too bad. Y'all watch it uh, and I'll be back. We'll finish up, talk soon. At the end of the Mississippi River, there is a place the Shada call Bulbuncha, place of many tongues, a place of many languages known better as the global port city colonizers rebranded as New Orleans, where a crossroads of waterways provides access to sites of sacred trade stewarded by the ancestors of these lands and waters. Generations have been weathering discrimination, land grabs, hurricanes, oil spill disasters, and the catastrophic side effects of man's manipulations flooding our ways of life. Our intertribal alliance, Oklahina Ikish Holo, people of the sacred medicine trail, is working to reestablish old trade routes and networks, adapting and co-designing paths for tradeways for the future, ways to exchange medicine, food, and skills to support biodiversity and sovereignty. This is a really exciting project that is rising up like a shining light out of one of the most polluted areas in all of Turtle Island, of all of the United States. An area that has been called Cancer Alley because of how much fossil fuel pollution is in this part of the United States. And instead show a place of regeneration and healing led by indigenous farmers who are building community, sharing stories of the land that are lifting up a very different vision of how we can move forward in this time 
of great transformation where we have a need to be able to live with each other in the land in a very different way. We believe that it is crucial for us to protect and reclaim our relationships with our sacred homelands and waters in order to restore the natural balance. So the intelligence of the system can be respected for our communities to survive in deep collaboration with the nature, like our grandmothers before us. Preparing for the unknown by putting our hands in the ground and our hearts into the work needed to strengthen decentralized systems of support from mutual aid to intentional investment and building circular economies. I think as we look at the multiple crises of the climate crisis and environmental degradation and colonization and environmental racism, that one of the most important things that we could be doing is to really support food sovereignty programs and food security, a way to really ensure cultural survival and cultural practices as we see storytelling taking place and the story of the seeds and the story of the communities and all these different peoples that came together on these trade routes. When we talk about what we're going to do about the climate crisis, what are we going to do about colonization, what are we going to do about respecting indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples rights, this is a response. Our gardeners are on a journey together, collectively learning and sharing skills hosting workshops on a spectrum of topics from composting to multimedia storytelling to medicine making, seed harvesting, and more. The Oklahina Ikisholo network of gardens connect us to each other, to traditional territories, to the places we call home, to the earth, and to the planetary work that is so urgently needed. But we know the plants carry the lessons to help us face the intersectional toxic challenges of injustices tied to colonial practices, perpetuated by multinational petrochemical corporations fueling the climate crisis. We are Uma, Shata, Osage, Lakota, Muscogee, Eastern Suyan, Suchungu Lakota, and Creole, femme and non-binary gardeners, seeding and growing and building across the Gulf South to defend and protect and to restore our lands and waters in the Mississippi River Delta and within the ancestral territories of the Shada and Muscogee. And it's one of the ways that we begin to really honor the call from indigenous peoples for land back, for rematriation of the land. And the dream of this project is a seventh generation project that will go on for many, many generations. <laughs> a beautiful message to go out on. Um, really happy for everybody that was able to tune in. Of course, uh, I'll try to do uh, as much of this, uh, keep all of the stuff pre-recorded, make sure I'm not messing myself up here. But making sure that um, we keep this, uh, we keep this online, we keep this accessible, um, and we keep on uh, making sure that we have people uh, that are willing to build with us. So very happy, very thankful for everybody who's, uh, who's joined. I'm also very thankful for the beans, the rice, the pepper, the, uh, the onion, the garlic, the, uh, the celery everything that has kind of given of themselves to, to have this time together. So here we go. It's not too bad. All right, be catch, be well, talk soon. <laughs>